Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. We're in the book of James, the third chapter, James chapter 3. Thank you for being here today. I really count it a privilege to be able to be your pastor. I have a love for um, England, but uh, more of a love for what God is doing in England and an even greater love for what God is doing in Aspire. Uh, and uh, that's a blessing that I can honestly say that to you today because of all the challenges through the years. To be able to say that, that's, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. So I hope no matter what you're going through today, your heart is open to believe that God can do something good in your life today, that he can help you and encourage you, lift you up, and even move you on in the things of God. And so James chapter 3 and verse 13, I think we have it. Yep, we surely do. It says, if you are wise and understand God's ways... Prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But, that tells us you might not be that person. Verse 13 is what we want, but verse 14 is a possibility. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and then he goes, even demonic. For wherever there is jealousy, verse 17 says, and selfish ambition, you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. It is also peace-loving and gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord God, for your power to come upon your people. Lord, for those who are fighting and wrestling against unbelief and not even sure why they're here today. God, I pray that you would encourage them and show them Help many of our people to make the first step in this area. And for others that are already growing, Lord God, I pray you would push them further and lead them on, Lord, for we never will arrive. We are always ever chasing and seeking after you. Have your way here today, Lord God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. When we started several weeks ago working through James in the opening uh, message, uh, we stated to you that one of the purposes of this letter was to address some immaturity in the lives of God's people. That's why James felt the desire to write it, and that's why God included it in the Word of God, in the Bible, because there's a tendency, even though we know we shouldn't be, sometimes to be immature. Now, maturity and wisdom, everybody say wisdom. Maturity and wisdom go hand in hand. And you know, the more that I've pondered this, studied it through the Bible, I realize that they're almost inseparable. That people are immature because they're unwise, and they're unwise because they're immature. And so understand that a person's maturity or growth is measured by their wisdom. Not by their age or their length of time in the things of God and uh, not by how much they've studied, even though all those things are good. Wisdom is important to maturity. In James 1.5, as we looked at early on, it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, in other words, the possibility exists that you and I might lack the wisdom that is needed. And I would like to tell you today, as a, as a viewer of what's going on in the world and uh, looking uh, into the lives of God's people and churches, not just Aspire or those that we're affiliated with, but Christians in general, there's a big lack, a 
of wisdom and maturity in the things of God. People often say, why is the church crumbling? Why is the church, uh, so many people leaving the church? And uh, why in America, it's a big, big deal. You know, why is it the de-churching of America? And, uh, you know, they're trying to come up with all of these philosophical and, and, and reasons why. But I'm here to say there's just a lack of depth, a lack of depth in God's people. John Stott, a great a uh, Church of England writer that wrote many years, for many years, he's passed on now. Uh, he was speaking in Australia, in Canberra, Australia, and he was asked, what is the greatest need of the church today? And his answer was, the church needs a greater number of deep Christians. Christians who are not shallow nor superficial, but deep and committed. Richard Foster, who wrote a book called The Celebrations of Discipline, which is a a very good book. It is quite deep, but it's a very good book. Uh, He makes a point in his book saying superficiality is the curse of our age. You know, and it's so true, man. We just, we want to sing a couple of worship songs and kind of come to church and talk to some bros and sisters and then move on and, 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 and that's good enough. But the Bible is not written in that method. The Bible is written in a greater depth for you and I. And so with that being said, I want to answer or help you answer this question. What makes a person wise? (laughs) What is it that's needed to be wise? Because we all can have our definitions, but what does God say? Well, as we've already said, uh, maturity and wisdom is not just necessarily from age. I know a lot of unwise old people. I know a lot of immature old people. So, uh, and I know some that are quite young that have not experienced a lot of life but are very wise. So uh, age is not a, a factor. It's not appearance. Some people look very wise and are not. I was studying at Central Library not long ago, and uh, I was sitting at a table there and studying, going through the work that I was doing, and all of a sudden, this Hasidic Jew sits down across from me, you know, one of these ultra-Orthodox Jewish men that has all the proper garb, has a beard, not quite as good as mine, but quite a good beard, (laughs) quite a good beard, and he looked extremely wise. And I was a little bit intimidated because he starts breaking out all his study equipment there and the things that he was going to do. He even had his lunch. He pulled his lunch out like he was going to eat there, like he was settling in, you know. And I was a bit intimidated, but, you know, I looked up. And, you know, if you've ever been to Central Library, there's a scripture in Proverbs that uh, one of the things that says is principle is the, uh, wisdom is the principal thing. And I thought, like, yeah, he may look wise, but only God knows if he really is wise. Not by look. It has nothing to do with achievement. Some people have grown big churches, pastor and lead big churches, big ministries, uh, great song leaders, and, and, and do worldwide events, but they can be unwise. You don't have to be mature to make millions. I know some of you young people, you know, that's your, your, your desire is to, you know, brand yourself, you know, and, and, and make something of yourself and become a millionaire by the time you're 30, you know. This is what I hear of young people, and I say, good luck with that. But that's what they want, but it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with academics. Wisdom is not just about academics. Nothing wrong with academics. As I said, I study a lot. I feel like I want to know more about the Bible. I spend a lot of time trying to learn more and more and more, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that in and of itself does not prove you're wise. As a matter of fact, there's a story about Albert Einstein. You will remember he was probably or at least called one of the greatest physicists of the, uh, that the world has actually ever known. And so he was at a dinner party, this story says, And as he's there, there's a young girl sitting next to him and can't quite picture who he is, doesn't really know what he does. And so she says, what is it that you actually do? I mean, what is your profession? And he says, I devote myself to the study of physics. And her response was one of astonishment. She looked at him and says, you mean you study physics at your age? And then she says, I finished mine a year ago. (laughs) See, the idea that 
that is somehow going to make you wise. Well, I've got this many courses under my belt. I've attended this many Bible colleges. I've, I've learned this about this and that. It's not necessarily making you wise. According to God, what really counts is attitude, is who you are, what kind of person you are, the character you have. You've heard this quote before. D.L. Moody said, character is what you are in the dark. And that's what God looks at as wise. So today, our desire is to get into this a little bit and give you some points that you can take home and put to practice. So if you're ready to launch, say, I'm ready. ready. Okay, James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. We studied this not long ago. It says, consider it pure Joy, pure what? Pure what? Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many or various diverse kinds because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature or wise and complete not lacking anything. So the first thing that a wise person is, is a person who can remain hopeful even when the heat is on, even when life is throwing pressure-filled situations, things that you were not expecting, trials that were coming from the right and from the left and from people that you like, whoa, I thought they were my friend. I thought I could trust them. And now look at them. They've totally walked away. And so the question is, can you remain hopeful, consider it pure joy, when that sort of thing happens, when the heat's on? How do you handle trials? The first test of maturity and wisdom is, how do you react when problems come? Do they blow you away? Do they send you to the point where you've crumbled, you're crushed, you you, you can't function because it's so difficult? How about the small ones? Do they make you nervous or uptight or negative? Do you grumble and gripe? See, these are all questions you have to ask yourself because if the answer is, uh, yeah, kind of, most of the time, sometime, if you're answering like that, then when the heat is on, you're losing hope. And that's not a good thing. It's not a mature thing. See, for those of you that are new or maybe know very little about Christianity, it's not a religion, it's a lifestyle. It's a life that we actually live. When we get out of this place, we don't just turn off our Christian. We're still Christian when we leave. We still live as Christians outside of church. It's a life and not a religion. Uh, uh, you've heard it said this, be, heard this said before. It's a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said this, I have come that you might have life. Not I have come so that you can be religious, but I have come so that you can have life. So when life hits, because life isn't always like it is on the Hollywood set. It isn't always like it is uh, in the fairy tale book. Life hurts. And causes problems from time to time. What is your natural attitude? What's your natural bent when these things begin to happen? Are you affirmative or are you angry when you're hitting these hardships? Are you positive under pressure? And I know you may say, boy, you just keep asking a lot of questions. That's because you already know this. You can read the verses, you know. But the question is, what are you and who are you? And if you're not living up to this and you're not hopeful, then come on. We can turn it out around. We can work on those things. James also tells us, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Next, first one is, a wise person is a person who is... Hopeful when the heat is on. Secondly, a wise person has a proper perception towards other people. 
Here's a scripture in James chapter 2 and verse 8. If you are really, or if you really keep the royal law, remember we studied about that royal law. It's a law that came from the king, King Jesus. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well or doing right. See, a wise person has this proper perception towards other people. Wise people are not just those who are locked in a room by themselves and have no connection. Wise people are ones that relate to to other people, some better than others, but all of us have to have this proper view of other people, and that's why it says, love your neighbor. And I want to tell you, love your neighbor is used as such a trite thing nowadays. We live in a world that, you know, you go to a religious church and they'll say, oh, yeah, I love your neighbor. And you'll go, yes, that's right. I'm going to go walk a couple of old ladies home today or pick up some uh, uh, shops for some ladies who need something or help this old man because he can't see. And, you know, I'm getting to the age where you might have to be doing that for me, so I'm not against that. But I'm not there yet. But I want to tell you that it's more than that. It's a deeper thing than that. Loving your neighbor is a deep thing that needs to be considered. It's a sensitivity towards other people. That's not easy and not automatic. It takes a little bit of work and effort. It's understanding people's hurts. But it's also understanding what people need when they're going through hard times. Sometimes people need a plaster, or sometimes people need what my dad used to do to me when I'd skin my knee and come home and cry. He'd say, come outside, and he'd get dirt, and he would rub it on my knee, and my mother would freak out, and my dad said, the boy will be all right. And I needed that, because next time I said, I ain't going telling him about that now. <laughs> I'll be okay. I'm going to make it. Tough love, (laughs) tough love. (laughs) Those of you that have small children, you're freaking out right now like how horrible that is. Those of us that have raised like a pack of kids and grandkids, we know exactly all about that. But my point being is that God is, uh, uh, is telling us that when we love others, it means we're interested in other people. It's an indicator of wisdom and maturity in our life. There's some people that just don't want anything to do with other people. You know, my mother is 82 years old, and I wasn't a good son. I've said this so many times when I was young. I wasn't a good son. So as she's gotten older, she lives by herself in the middle of the desert in Arizona, and I worry about her and all those things. I was never a mama's boy, so I I know nothing about how to treat my mother properly. So I've just tried to be a good son as I became a Christian now. And uh, uh, she started going to church, and I was so happy about that, you know, like, my God, she went to church. Uh, This is so exciting. You know, we weren't raised in church. I knew nothing about church until I came to Christ, and for her to go to church was a big thing, and so I asked her the last time I was over, I said, so how's church? She goes, ah, church is fine. It's all them people in there. A bunch of old people go to that church. I'm like, Mom, you're 82, you know, Uh, but the point is, is that when you are wise, You love other people. James, we've read already as we studied through in James chapter 2 in the first six verses, it gets kind of into detail what he means about how to treat other people. It says, don't show that sin of partiality. Don't show favoritism. Don't be a snob. Don't look down on people. Don't judge by appearance. Don't insult people. Don't exploit people. I mean, you know, that's what we do. We, We don't manipulate people. We're honest and open as much as we can be. (laughs) See, recognize with me how we treat people is one of the things that we're going to be as Christians judged for. If you read Matthew chapter 25, I won't go into the scripture now, but you might want to write this down. And uh, uh, that judgment that's taking place there is going to be based on how we treated people. Wise people recognize this. Mature people recognize care about other people. The third thing, the third indicator of wisdom and maturity. Are you with me here today? Following along? I haven't bored you yet. 
No? Okay, good. If I have, don't worry, it'll be over soon. A wise person has mastered their mouth. Another story about my father. I must have a lot of father stories on my mind today. I don't usually talk about my dad too much. He passed away many years ago. But he used to tell me when I was a kid, he goes, you've got a mouth on you, boy. And being that I would say things and I wouldn't be ashamed to talk back and I shouldn't when I, and he would tell me that. And the truth is, is that a lot of us have mouths on us and our mouths get us into trouble. (laughs) Isn't that true? Come on, has anybody, who has gotten their mouth, has gotten them into trouble? Thank you, Gracie, for raising your hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How about you, buddy? Yeah? You got a big haircut there. (laughs) I'll wait here. See you later, big guy. Someone should have got a picture of that because that's like I've been preaching for like 25 years, and I think this is the first time this is. I've had a lot, I've had drunks come after me and uh, throw wine bottles from the back, but. This one was much more pleasurable. But James tells us in James chapter 3 and verse number 2, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. You know, sometimes when you go to a doctor, it hasn't happened to me recently, but it seemed like it used to be always part of the checkup. Is they would come in, they'd check your ears, check, you know, put your eyes, and then they'd say, stick out your tongue. You remember they would do that, stick out your tongue, and they'd put that tongue depressor on there, look at your tongue and make sure everything's fine. It was an indicator, one of the indicators of health. Can I want to tell you something here today, spiritually speaking? How you speak, what's coming out of your mouth is an indicator of what's going on inside of your heart. It's an indicator of how wise or mature you are. You know, I've had uh, uh, one man in particular that uh, was saying lots of nasty things and uh, uh, lots of ungodly, unspiritual, unrighteous things. uh, And then at the end of his rant, uh, he says, uh, and I've been a Christian for 45 years. And in my mind, I'm just shocked going, could have fooled me, bro. Could have fooled me. Because what you say determines a lot about who you are. You'll all remember if any of you have studied World War II, loose lips sink ships. In other words, don't gossip, don't say things. You never know where those words are going to go and what can happen. There's one particular uh, popular computer company that was having problems with new devices being leaked to the press so the, one of the managers of one particular division put a sign up in the break room that says, loose lips get pink slips. Pink slips are like P45s, you know, like you get canned. You talk too much, you're going to lose. I want to tell you, when you say the wrong things as a Christian and you offend people, it hurts because gossip in any form hurts others. I read this definition of gossip that I thought was quite cute and probably very true. It says, it's hearing something you like about somebody you don't. Let that sink in. Heard this other one. It's called mouth-to-mouth recitation. Not resuscitation, but recitation, like you say it again, mouth. No, went over your head. Okay, it's all right. Self-control. In your life, how many want self-control? We all do. It comes from tongue control. It starts with being able to control your mouth. And that's why in the book of James, the third chapter, it gives several illustrations about our tongue. It's likened to a rudder. It can steer the ship. It's a bit in a horse's mouth that determines what path you're going to go on. It's like a spark that can spark a fire. It's like a a, a snake. It's like a spring uh, Whatever the case may be, our tongue plays an influential role in our lives and other people's lives. And recognize with me today that it determines a lot about your wisdom. 
and your maturity. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 29 says, Do not let any negative talk come out of your mouth. (laughs) You know, I've read that forever, that verse. And then, you know, it hit me the other day, any negative talk. Man, that was savage conviction upon me. Because I think I do pretty good with not being negative. And I even try to help other people by trying to point out positive things. And I, I think I'm doing pretty good. But any negative talk, difficult. Can you say amen? Not easy. Try and watch because oftentimes we want to say something. We want to say what we feel. And we go, well, it's just the truth. <laughs> There's lots of truth, but not all of it needs to be said. Can you say amen? Amen. So, just to recap before we start to wind down, a wise person can remain is one who can remain hopeful even when the heat is is on. A wise person has a proper perception towards others. They love their neighbor. A wise person is one who has mastered or is mastering their mouth. But also, a wise person is a peacemaker and not a troublemaker. (laughs) Peacemaker, not a troublemaker. You know, I was thinking about times in my life, family, workplace, ministry, churches that I've been a part of. And thinking about when there's been conflict, you know, disagreements, uh, honest, different points of view. And it just was real. I wasn't trying to say one side was right and one side was wrong. I had my opinions, but there was all of that. But I thought how people handled that is what really, really matters. And how they viewed themselves in the midst of this really matters. James chapter 4 and verse number 1 says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Now before we read, and you can read on the up there on the screen already, that second one, second sentence, but if you were to ask, where do fights and quarrels come from among you? Ah, well, when that person does this. Or when these people don't do that. Or when all of this blew up because of this. That's where it comes from. James is not denying that that is part of the problem. But he's trying to get us as his people to look at this bit. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Isn't it? The fact that you're part of the problem, you have to own some of it, maybe not all of it, but some of it, you have to take (laughs) some of it as your problem. And see, this is the difference between being a troublemaker and a peacemaker. A peacemaker is someone who stands in the middle and says, come on, let's bring two sides together. Let's bring warring parties together, factions that disagree. Let's bring them together. Maybe it's you and your husband, or maybe it's you and your child, or maybe it's you and a friend. Yeah, they've done what they've done. They've said what they've said. They've got their issues and their problems, but the question is not that. We already know that. What about you? You know, what about what's going on in here? And honestly, I know Christians that have been Christians for a long time, and they still struggle with this. And instead of being peacemakers, they don't mean to be, but they inadvertently become troublemakers because they fail to look within. James here is talking directly to relational conflict, relationships that are in conflict. And they come from our inner desires to want things, to desire things. He says you, and the rest of the uh, passage says, you kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. And that's what it is. I want him to be like this. I want him to stop doing that. 
I wish they could just do it like this. Why do they have this in place? What kind of policy is that? We want, we want, we want. We'll even kill for it. We'll slander, hurt, cut. And I know some of you are saying, boy, this doesn't sound like church today, but this is real life. This is real life. This is what you're, you're, you're going to face tomorrow when you go to work. You don't get to live in blissful worship at a spire type thing, you know. This is like real life. And that's what the Bible is addressing here. And so you have to start asking yourself, am I a peacemaker or am I a troublemaker? And I know none of us would really classify ourselves probably immediately as a troublemaker, but if you're not a peacemaker, then you probably are a troublemaker, at least in certain instances. Ask yourself some personal questions. Do I like to argue? Am I contentious by nature? I used to know this guy. He's passed on now, but uh, I used to know this guy. And he was a really good guy, really uh, enthusiastic about the things of God and really loved the Lord and really loved ministry and like being involved in the uh, church and the people of God. But he was just contentious. Everywhere he went, he caused trouble. You know, and what I mean by that is like, you know, we could be discussing something here and the pros and the cons, and he would just like lob this verbal bomb in the middle of the thing. Like, well, what about this? And what about that? And his questions weren't, uh, you know, horrible, but they were totally contentious. It's who he was. Are you that kind of person? Because then you're going to cause a lot more trouble than you're going to uh, fix. Do my feelings get easily hurt? Am I easily defensive? Because that's another problem that happens when you're talking about relationships. I realized I was already uh, in my 40s when I realized my feelings get easily hurt. And I never could admit that before because I grew up in a very tough environment. I grew up in an environment where you did not admit that your feelings were hurt, that you were a tough guy. You know, you were on the streets. You didn't let nobody know nothing. You, 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 you settled arguments with your fists or with your words, but you never uh, uh, settled arguments by talking about them. But in my 40s, I realized, wow, you know what I am? easily hurt and that was causing me to be defensive so whenever there was a relational conflict either in my marriage or with my kids or with my brothers or sisters in Christ sometimes that would cause me to be a troublemaker instead of a peacemaker so I've admitted my flaws where you admit yours see some of you just were like listening then you put your head down right there (laughs) don't like that bit but this is how we get there We're just about done. James gives us two reasons for conflict. And he says in verse 3, he says, When you ask, you do not receive. And he says, But you ask with the wrong motives, the wrong heart. You're praying, but your heart's not right. And the reason your heart's not right is because whatever you get, you want to spend it on your pleasures. In other words, Lord, change her. Tell her to stop doing this, to stop nagging, to stop hurting, to stop bothering, to to stop being so controlling. But why do you want that? Because you want to spend it on your pleasures. That's Christian language for being selfish. Selfish, and that's the primary cause of conflict, isn't it? And that's the opposite of what Jesus did. Jesus took his whole life and he had total control. Everything was created by him, for him, and through him. He was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And yet he said, you know, it's not all about what I want. It's what you want. Your will be done, Father. He was unselfish. And that's why he was the wisest that we know. When you want what you want, and you're determined to get what you want, then conflict is going to happen. There's going to be a head-butting somewhere. I've been doing a lot of reflecting on our marriage the last week or so. And, you know, I was thinking, like, we're pretty strong-willed people, you know, pretty aggressive people. And as much as we try to not be like that, it's kind of like God's design. That's how we're wired 
But, you know, one of the things I was telling Gracie, I said, you know, one of the things I appreciate about you, and I mean this from my heart, is that you never, ever nag me. She does not nag. She tells me what she wants, and she might send a friendly little reminder about what she wants, but she never nags. Can I tell you, those that are married and those that want to be married, never nag your spouse. It's, I want what I want. I want what I want. Bring me what I want. I don't want that. I want this. Hey, you know I don't wear that. I only wear this. How much was that? No, I, I need this. You know, if you're that kind of person, conflict will happen. And you say, well, he or she's okay with that. Let me talk to them. Let me have a little conversation with them and see if that's really the case. Because some, oh, I don't want to get into this, but here I'm, I'm in it. Is that, see, because see, sometimes people just act like it's not a problem when it's a problem. They sometimes don't say those things because they don't want, they'd rather just not rock the boat. You know, and that's why, I, again, I'm not just trying to toot Gracie's horn because we all have flaws and she has her own and I have my own, but this th- th- one excellent quality of not being a nag, she's not trying to, like, undermine or try to get something or to manipulate. It's just a stating of what she needs or desires, and we'll see how that goes and doesn't pressure. See, and this is a very important in our relationships, Because sometimes when we don't get what we want, we'll go to extreme measures. And that's why James chapter 4 and verse 11 and 12 says, Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges that. And that's why we need to slow down and be cautious when we're in the middle of conflict. Because we really don't know everything God knows. God is the one who is in charge. There may be a reason why you're not getting what you want. There may be a reason why something is not fixed the way that you think it should be fixed. See, understand, and I know you know this, but we don't live like this, is that only God has all the facts, right? He has all the facts. He knows why they're doing it. One of the things I just, oh, sends me through the moon is when people tell me what I'm feeling you know oh you're doing that because of this oh you said that because of that oh this is why you did that oh you can see my motives well you want to get on my bad side tell me how I'm feeling you want to know how I'm feeling just ask I'll tell you if you want to know my motives just ask I'll tell you everyone who works with me knows that I'm very transparent when you ask But boy, don't tell me what I feel. You don't know. You're not God. You don't know. You can't see. You're just making a judgment by what you see. And that hurts when we do that. We don't know motives. Only God does. And that's why we bring these things to God. God, here's how I feel. That's okay. God, I feel let down, disappointed. I, I, I feel angry. I feel upset. I feel left alone. I feel belittled. I feel humiliated. That's all good praying, man. You can pray like that. But you can't say, and I want you to get the one who humiliated me and belittled them and tell them to stop it. And they're, they think they're all that and a bag of crisp, man, and they're nothing. You can't pray like that. Because God already knows they ain't all that. God knows. God knows. And that's why we pray with the right motives. God, your will be done. So we're closing here, okay? We're going to finish right now. How many want, don't raise your hand, how many want to be wise and mature? I think if we're honest, we all do. You know, the sad thing is is that when you're in your teens and 20s, you want to mature. You want to grow up. You want to be grown. Then when you get 30s, 40s and start having families and uh, living in the fullness of life, sometimes we don't care about being wise anymore. Just give me what I want. But we should want to grow and want to be wise and want to be mature. 
And so we have to ask ourselves, how do I handle problems? How do I deal with the trials? What is my attitude towards other people? Am I loving my neighbor like Christ loved me? Am I managing my mouth? And none of us are going to be perfect. That was the implication of James 3, 2, is that if any man can bridle his tongue, uh, his whole life will be bridled. And none of us do that. And I, I, I know that, but neither should that be an escape clause. <laughs> well, hey, you spoke rude to me. Well, you speak rude too. Uh, true, true. What does that have to do with you, though? See, we need to manage our mouths, watch what we do. Let's not damage people. Mature people, wise people don't want to damage. They want to resolve this without hurting people. See, anybody can get a gun, shoot somebody. Anybody can get a knife and hurt somebody. Anybody can settle a problem with a weapon. But can you settle a problem and make both sides happy? Can you settle a problem with the grace of God? favor of God, the peace of God. Are you that troublemaker? I want what I want. I know I'm right. I know I'm right. I'm right. You may be right, but you're a troublemaker. Or are you a peacemaker? See, and the reason I'm preaching this today is because I want us all to be wiser I believe what Mr. Stott said before he died, the great lack in the Christian world today is the lack of depth amongst his people. I believe what Richard Foster said, the superficiality is the curse of the Christian church. Let's not let that be with the Christians that have come here. Let's us be wise. Are we in agreement? Thank you. Give the Lord a big hand clap today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads? We're going to pray. We'll put on some music softly, and I'm just going to pray over you and ask you some questions and give you a chance to respond to this. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your goodness, for your word. We admit that it's challenging. We admit that it's a, not easy to be wise. It's hard sometimes, Lord God but we want to be wise. We want to mature. We want to grow. We want to be Christians of some depth to make a difference in this world. Let us not just be church attenders, God. Let us be Christ followers. Let us be not just say we're spirit-filled, but let us live like the spirit's in us. God, let that be real. Let that be real in our lives. Help us to do our part. And I know, God, and we thank you for you doing your part. Thank you for your goodness today. In Jesus' name. So we're here this morning. We're just about ready to dismiss, and your heads are bowed, and maybe you've come into the church today, and you're not a Christian, and maybe you had no intention of becoming a Christian. I can honestly tell you that the first time I went to Christian church as an adult, I never, ever thought I would become a Christian. That wasn't my purpose but God had other plans and change occurred and even though I was scared because I didn't know what to do and I didn't know how I would be and I wasn't like all these religious people that were around me but once I came to Christ I realized that God was what this was all about Jesus was my savior he needed to be my king And once I finally grasped that in my mind and accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, life started to change. My outlook, my perception, people were not obstacles, but they were now friends. Bad things that happened to me in life were no longer uh, uh, things that set me way back, but they were viewed as things that God had ordained for my life. When good things happened, I didn't say, hey, it's all about me. I realized this was all about a loving God who gave himself for me. And if you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please let us just pray a prayer with you. You don't have to have a particular feeling 
to pray the prayer. You do have to have a particular mind that says yes to the Lord. Yes, I want that. I want my sins forgiven. I can admit that my sins are stain on who I am. If that's you, we can pray with you. Just lift your hand all across this place. If you're a backslider that's fallen far from God, we can pray with you as well. Lead you to the Lord. Just lift your hand, anybody at all, before we move on today. Hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you. Somebody else today, you want to say yes to the Lord, you can raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus. If you're watching online and you say, yep, I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've fallen far from God. You can pray this prayer as well. Why don't we all stand to our feet today? Praise God. If you want to accept the Lord or rededicate your life, we'd like to have someone pray with you. And if you meant that, would you come on up to the front so we can pray with you today? Maybe Pastor Dave can help and help us pray. Somebody else today, you would say, yes, I need the Lord today in my life. Maybe you're already a Christian, but in areas that we discussed, you're in need of some help. I know how that feels. God can help you today. I want to open this altar and have you come on up to the front so we can pray with you today. Is anybody like that today? I want to be wise. I want to be mature. There's some areas of my life that I need to be rearranged. Hallelujah. Come on up to the front today. Pastor David, could you come up, please? Thank you, Jesus. Let's stretch forth our hands. We're going to pray for these people that are here today. Is there any more? There's plenty of room. You can make your way up today. Father, we come before you today. And we pray, Lord God, for every area of our heart that needs to change. We thank you, Jesus, that you give us the power that we can to change, that we do not have to live in anger and uh, uh, being upset, that we can be people who are affirmative and positive and strengthening and encouraging, Lord God. We know that we face uh, many difficulties and trials, Lord God, from the outside and from the inside. But God, we want to be able to handle these trials with joy and with positivity and with a, an outlook of how you view them, not how we feel about them. God, help us with our uh, way we speak towards others and even to ourselves and the way that we talk and the things that we say and let come out of our mouths, Lord God. Begin to produce in us a newness that uh, causes us not to war and to fight over selfish things, Lord God. Let that not be who we are today. We confess that they have at times ruled our hearts. But today, Lord God, we want to lay them down at your throne and ask that you would bless us and help us and encourage us today. Thank you, Lord, for blessing and strength and power that only you can give today, Lord. Bless my brothers and sisters that are here today, those that are uh, at the altar and those who are in the audience, Lord God, those who are home. I pray that you would bless them as well. Thank you for providing, Lord God, and meeting each and every need, Lord God. Thank you for blessing, God. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, make us wise, make us mature, Lord. Let us grow and advance to the path that you have for us. Step by step, Lord God. If we've fallen behind, pull us forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Could you give him praise today? Lift your voice and hand clap today. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for joining us today at Aspire Church. If the message today has blessed you, or there's something we can help you with, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at aspirechurch.co.uk.
We meet in different locations throughout the week. And if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you visit us. You can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk. Or if you'd like further information, find us on Facebook, look us up on Twitter. We also live stream all of our services. And once again, if you'd like to view online, you can find all the details on our website. Thank you for joining us today, being part of our ministry. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.